to you, if we don't have fluency with a child, then we're not going to have comprehension later. Because if it, and fluency simply is, it's really three things, but two are more important, I think. Uh, fluency is rate and accuracy. Okay? So if you're not reading quickly enough, if, if reading is so laborious, if it takes you so long to pull the written word off the page, you literally don't have enough mental energy left to make sense of what you're reading. Right? It just makes perfect sense. If you're taking 30 seconds to read one word in a sentence, my goodness, by the time you get to the end of a 12-word sentence, you, don't, you have no idea what you just read. So you have to be fluent. And you have to be accurate, right? It's one thing to be able to read quickly, but if you're not reading the words accurately, <coughs> if you're reading them just by what they look like, not by what they're, uh, and you're making substitution errors, then you're certainly not going to have comprehension because you're not reading the words correctly. So we have to get to fluency. Um, another, the next aspect is vocabulary. So now we have a fluent reader, great. I give them the great oral reading test, which is uh, a fluency test, and I see he's got great appropriate rate, he has great appropriate accuracy, therefore he has great appropriate fluency. Terrific. Does that necessarily mean they're going to have comprehension? No, because comprehension is also dependent upon vocabulary. Um, unfortunately, what happens is kids who don't read, because reading is difficult or because they haven't been taught, there's this, this Matthews effect, we call it, that happens. Good readers' vocabulary grows exponentially compared to a poor reader. So a good reader who reads a lot is, is acquiring vocabulary through their reading. A poor reader is not. And that really impacts comprehension. Again, if you don't know the meanings of words, how are you going to know? And, 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 and as you get older and older, uh, you need to know more and more words. And when you get into uh, highly technical science uh, curriculum and social studies, psychology and so forth, you're really, really at a deficit. Okay, so we have to teach vocabulary very explicitly too. And part of teaching vocabulary is morphology. So morphology is the study of, of uh, the meaning of words and, and morphemes. Morphemes are the smallest word parts that hold meaning. So in the word, how many morphemes are there in the word dogs? It's late, I'll help you. There are two morphemes, dog, right, and s, the plural ending. So you get a morpheme can be as, as simple as a, a letter. Uh, it's generally groups of letters. How many morphemes in the word salamander? How many meaningful word parts in salamander? Just one salamander, but no other parts to it. Okay? Um, let's take a look at this. this. This was actually something that I taught. This is a morphology lesson I taught about 20 years ago to an 11-year-old kid. And we were, and he was a fluent reader now. And the other thing I should mention, this is, this isn't necessarily, um, I've got to do phonemic awareness and then I'm done. I do phonics and then I'm done. I do, now I'm doing vocabulary and I'm done. And now I'm going to do comprehension and I'm done. All of these skills can be taught simultaneously and should be taught simultaneously. So as I'm teaching a child phonics, I can also work on morphology, just at a different level more of an oral level than a reading level. But this, this was an 11-year-old uh, student that I was working with, an 11-year-old boy, and he was a good reader, and we were working on morphology to, for vocabulary uh, acquisition. So the prefix, in, in the, the morphemes of important, there are three, uh, M, port, and ant. M was really at one time N, and it changed to M because the P in port, you make the, the port sound, the P is made with your lips, right? And the where's the M sound made? Same place, right? So, mm. so for efficiency's sake, that N moves to M, and that happens a lot. Um, there's an acclimation that goes on in 
in changing a sound based on what the next sound is. It's called the core articulation principle. And you have, uh, so it's in is in or into. Port is a Latin root meaning carry. And ant is just an adjectival suffix. So I said to this kid, Jonathan, um, how do you think that the word important, if you, if you put its literal meaning, meaning carry into, how did that come to mean very great or highly valued? How do you think? Where, how did that happen? And it's a very interesting answer that he gave. He goes, well, this was probably created back in the time of the Romans. And the Romans back then, you know, transportation, they didn't have planes, trains, cars, and so forth. So for somebody to carry some, uh, something of some weight from one place to another to carry it into another country, that something must have had high value. It must have been worth something for somebody to take all the effort to do it. So that was a kid at 11 years old trying to make sense of, of, of morphological aspects of the word. And I think that, that's just a great thing for a kid to be thinking about, you know, because you're testing kind of cognitive, and you're making the, the student connect word parts, word study, to reality. And I think that you just don't take the time to do things like that. And we can also use analogies to teach uh, vocabulary. So this is something that'd be good for us to do. So if an analogy is a comparison, you're comparis comparing two ideas or two concepts. So you have uh, the, the key words of this analogy, beacon and sailor. So I can create a, a, a key, a, a bridge sentence that bridges these two ideas together by saying a sailor uses a beacon <coughs> to guide him at night. Okay, it's a, it's a good bridge sentence. It shows the relationship between these two concepts. Now, what, what have I done to the order here in my bridge sentence? I flipped it, right? Sailor's second here, but I've made it first in the sentence, which is fine to do, but we just have to maintain that when we use the bridge sentence. So, beacon and sailor are our keywords, and we have to pick the best answer here below. So, what, what's the best? Answer. What you want to do is take the answer choices and substitute them back in the sentence in the same order. So I use sailor with second, so I'm going to take the second word and put it first. Yeah, so you'd say, go through all, and the kids would go through all of them. So uh, athlete uses our nutrition to guide him at night. Uh, no, that doesn't work. A reader uses a lamp to guide him at night. Yeah, so I'd have the kids put a little asterisk that it might be the right answer. A cowboy uses a horse to guide him at night. Well, could be. I put an asterisk that might be true. A smoker uses a pipe to guide him at night. Not so much. I'd cross that one out. The public uses an advertisement to guide him at night. Not so much. I'd have horse and cowboy, lamp and reader. What's the best answer? Lamp and reader because of the light aspect. Now, the point of this is probably, you know, a 10-year-old, 11-year-old uh, student wouldn't know what a beacon is, and often they wouldn't know some of the vocabulary of the, of the words here. So I'd have them start a vocabulary notebook and put these words in and their definitions. The other thing, you know, there's another aspect of teaching analogies that's really good for kids, too. Well, what do you think that is? It's not just vocabulary development. Abstract thinking. Yeah, it's critical thinking skills, right? It's being able to link conceptually two words together. What's the relationship? And that's a lot of what comprehension is. Discerning relationships the abstractions in what you read. So this kills a couple birds with one stone. It kills the vocabulary bird and it helps with the comprehension. And then our last, you know, what are we actually trying to do? Why do we read? We read to understand. So this is the end goal, but again, if you have, if you have great phonemic awareness skills, great phonics skills, great fluency skills, and a growing vocabulary, does that mean you're necessarily going to comprehend what you read? I could put something in front of you, you could read every single word of it, but you wouldn't be able to tell me what it really means unless 
you're an astrophysicist, right? So you have to have an appropriate amount of background knowledge as well. So what are comprehension strands within the fifth strand of, of reading? We have other strands. We have main idea strands. We have detail strands. We have cause and effect and inference and interpretation. But we have to teach all of these directly, explicitly, sequentially. And these are some of the, the these are different um,